evening, sir. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. What's up, buddy? How's it going? First of all, I want to apologize for coming off as a troll. I'm not really trying to do that. It's not uh it's kind of unprofessional of me. I do apologize, but yeah, I was no literally just just brought that video was just brought to my attention uh last night. And I finally had a chance to actually go through and look at it. And I kind of wanted to address some of the things that were said because um uh, just uh, in general, it seems kind of like there's a lot of misnomer between what people think of blue collar jobs and the actual necess uh, the necessity and the demand for said jobs. Sure. But again, it's not it's not like it's not like um <clears throat> I actually I was just I literally just hung up with a friend of mine who um uh, big follower of yours. I I personally um besides that one video and I think another one that I might have clicked on with another YouTuber um really haven't um, had any interactions with uh, your content. This so guy is a cut. I'm not exactly sure if these positions are just kind of sort of nuanced to that conversation or if this is something you kind of do believe on a general. Well, let's uh, let's talk about the positions that you think I have that you have an issue with. Sure. Okay. We can do that. Yeah. So I guess what, what did I say that, that that triggered you so hard, I guess, in that conversation? What did I say that really upset you? <laughs> Yeah, the, the the fifis, man, the fifis. Um, so okay, we can jump right into it. So this uh, debate you had with Sargon of Akkad, mm -hmm. um, the um, when you guys were talking about immigration and economics. So it's that video mm -hmm. right around the one twenty nine mark, somewhere around in there. Sure. Let me backtrack a little bit here. So you had talked about working as a carpet cleaner. Yeah, something yeah, for a little over a year, yeah. Um Well I well I would agree with you that some jobs that would be considered like middle class, uh low 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 skill jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Um you know, for example, being a being a guy at the work in the assembly line making seven twenty five an hour at Amazon, for example. Mm -hmm. Probably not as noble as what I'm talking about, which is the truckload industry. We'll, we'll just keep it as a broad topic, trucking in general. Sure. Can I, can I, real quick, before we get too far into this, I never, I don't, if I did, I misspoke, but I don't think I necessarily spoke to the nobility of, of, of doing certain work. I mean, I think you should probably be proud of any work you do. I mean, it's, it's your work, it's what you do to survive. I don't think that there's anything that you should be ashamed of doing or anything like that. I don't know if I gave that impression, but... Um, let me... Double check because I do have the video queued up. Mm -hmm. You guys were talking about the nobility of construction and you had said that it's something that people are forced into and it's not necessarily a field of nobility. It's a field of necessity because they view it as an out. The, typically when you talk about most c kind of, I'll say, shitty jobs, it's that's usually the way that I view it, yeah. Well, and so, okay, so specifically to my my industry, mm -hmm. the trucking industry it's a shit job nobody's mm. gonna deny that it yeah. oh, no it, it, it is it is it's a shit job you make it you're making a lot of social sacrifices a lot of personal sacrifices the uh the work-life balance is very poor sure but economically speaking you can make some pretty darn good money in the industry sure but especially you, you know if you're if that, you're over the road, if you're over the road, the average driver working for one of these big Fortune 500 carriers, there's a top 20 list you can easily Google and find out. Swift is the biggest one of them, mm -hmm. um, and that's the one I currently am employed with. Um, my startup, whose account I messaged you through, um, we are looking to be disruptive to the trucking industry in terms of the the policies that we incorporate into what makes us a company but we are using very much we are using uh jerry moise's uh, business model that he did when he started swift in 66 so basically take one truck one truck buys a second truck two trucks buy four trucks and grow exponentially okay so but <clears throat> you look at that guy you know middle-class kid from um, suburb of Utah, 
right? His dad, his dad was a truck driver. He then worked with his dad at the same trucking company, bought his first truck, started making his own money, made his own company, and now the man's worth billions of dollars. Okay. So to say that there's no money to be made in professions like that, I mean, I, I don't well, necessarily well, know so much for, about con- the construction field well, itself. For, for well, hold on. I mean, like, not everybody, one, is even going to be probably buying their own truck, and not everybody is going to be building their own multi-billion dollar successful business, right? That's not really fair. Well, to be, to be fair, if you, if, you want to call, if you want to call a spade a spade, so to speak, most truck drivers are company drivers um, based on experience. They need to build that experience up. But a lot of them do go that own independent owner-operator route because they do realize that there is more money to be made brokering your own freight. Sure. Number one. And number two, it's not exactly – there's not a lot of input to do that. Sure. I mean you're looking – you can go you can go online right now. And find a truck, uh, you know, a used tractor anywhere between eleven thousand and sixty thousand dollars. A trailer would probably be about the same same price range, let's say, between used and brand new. You're probably talking about somewhere between five digits and six digits. Same thing with a tractor. You want to go to a showroom and buy something brand new is probably going to cost you, you know, hundred thousand dollars. Okay. So, but to take something, you know, you don't have to have the the most brand spanking new shiny piece of equipment out there to make the money. Mm -hmm. What you need is it needs to be something dependable and reliable. It's the same thing. Now, it's not – okay, let me let me step back a second and rephrase. So it's not the same thing, for example, if you wanted to start your own construction company. Sure, I understand. This is actually really comparable to carpet cleaning, believe it or not, where some guys will buy their own carpet cleaning truck and they'll sell jobs out of their own truck instead of like working for another company and driving their trucks and whatnot. You just have to make that small initial investment into a vehicle and then you can go out and sell jobs on your own and keep 100% of the margin instead of having to pay an owner or whatever for their equipment, right? Right, and and, and it would be... It would be comparable, I would say, in in a, in, a, in the small sense. Mm-hmm. The brokers are usually going to take a fee either up front or per mile, mm-hmm. uh, because that's the revenue stream that we we uh, we use in this career field. But there's something I wanted to touch on too, real quick. Um, I happen to have the statistics pulled up here. So one of the because th- one of the things that tied into that conversation was um, the minorities. And getting getting those people into these kind of jobs, um, the current demographics right now, there's 3.5 million drivers with Class A CDLs, mm-hmm. which is a federal license. Yep. Right. The commercial there's, driver license. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> out of out of that, 13% are women, which is up from 11% from 2014. These are 20. Uh, these are 2016 statistics, by the way. Mm-hmm. So as as most recent as we can get. Right. Uh, 28% of them are um, black or African-American. 14% are Hispanic. 5% are, were um, identified as other ethnic background. Uh, there's no special advertising. There's no TV. There's no radio. I mean, they do, uh, they do do a lot of social media. These big, these bigger companies, they'll do a lot of social media campaigns mm-hmm. to boost their numbers. But that's just because like any other big corporation, there is a... Um, there is a, there's, um, there's, there's quotas, mm-hmm. right? There's quotas that they have to make, in, uh, you know, for their, um, I forget what the word is right now. Um, my girlfriend, she works in recruiting, she works for RPO, which is a outsourcing recruiting company, does all the stuff for Comcast and waste management and stuff like that. So gotcha. I've, uh, I forget what exactly the term is here, but, um, you know, that's kind of out of my depth of field personally, but, um, the, um, and what, and what makes me, and what makes me, what seriously tickles me is that a lot of people will say that, oh, well, you know, there's, um, like the, like feminists, for example, right. Mm -hmm. They'll say, well, there's, uh, there's a huge pay gap in STEM. But there's, if you're going to look at STEM, which is a highly competitive field, there's an e- there should be an evil, uh, a, a correlating response to the middle class jobs, right? Whether you're talking about skilled labor as far as trades or you're talking about unskilled labor, there should be some correlating data. 
but well, what, not necessarily, but, take, but okay. I mean, there the, could be wage discrimination. No, I, I, I said should. I, I didn't say would. I, I didn't say I said should. There should be. But what tickles me is that if you really did believe in equality, me personally, and this is just a personal opinion. I mean, you could, you know, break it down and disseminate it from there. But me personally, what I see, the women that are in my career field as either as independent owner operators or working for a company or working for a, you know, small mom and pop shop, you know, five, six trucks, whatever. Um, they're very happy where they're at. I mean, they're not treated you're, when you're in the trucking industry, when you're in a truck specifically, you're not seen as a, a as a, a male, a female, a transgender, um, you know, an African-American, a, a, you know, a Mexican, a Puerto Rican or whatever. Right. You're, you're seen as a truck number. You're seen as an available truck to move freight and make money, make the well, make the owners of that truck money, make the people working that truck money and making yourself money. So, I mean, and it and it is pretty equal. And I say pretty equal because it does depend on work ethic and not everybody's work ethic is, you know, a shining example of what we all need to be. That's for sure. But on a general on a general size, I mean, you're talking about. Your average somewhere around 136,000 miles a year. You're making somewhere between, I don't know, if you're starting brand new with zero experience, just out of fresh out of school, you're talking about maybe 36,000 a year upwards from there. Like I personally, I'm making 40, no, 52,000 after taxes. So, I mean, it's not exactly, I mean, again, it's a hard job because there's a lot of stuff to take into account. You know, I don't always, you know, I'm not always home. In fact, I'm pretty far away from home most sure. of the time. So just going back to the first thing you said, it seems like you're kind of making my argument for me. In the, in the initial thing you said, you said that you can make okay money being a truck driver, but you have to make immense social sacrifices to do it. Um, oftentimes when, when you're out, you're, you're gone from home at least multiple days, right? If not like, I know that some truck jobs will guarantee your home like once a week or maybe even a little bit more than that, but you're gone. Well, pretty see, often, and that's right? something, and that is something that I wanted to cover real quick. Just kind of cover all the bases here before sure. I moved on to something else it was that if you could make like the you, same money doing something that didn't involve so much traveling though, doesn't that make this kind of a job of necessity? Like, no, because it's still, it's still a voluntary position. You could join a you could join a Teamster union and do local. You could drive for UPS and do local and be home every day. Yeah, but I imagine those jobs are probably way, way, way more competitive, though, right? It's probably a lot harder to get those kinds of jobs. No, you probably need more background. They're not going to take somebody fresh out of high school or something or off the street or something like that. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily one hundred percent. I, I couldn't. Well, I if that weren't true, then everybody I, I, would work those jobs, right? Nobody would be a trucker, right? Well, that's not necessarily true either, and this is and this is part of it. Is there is a lot of stigma, especially when it comes to media, about drivers. For example, I'm not sure if you're keeping up with um, current events. There was an independent owner operator that they're looking for. Um, his truck and trailer were confiscated down there in um, San Antonio just this past week or two weeks. Where they found all those um, illegal immigrants in the trailer. Most of them were already dead, and the ones that were survived or did survive actually did die because of um, heat exhaustion, so, uh, extreme heat exhaustion. Okay, what about it? Well, the point is, you hear it's not like it used to be during the 60s and the 70s, right? Especially after deregulation. What you hear now. In movies, you know, like Joyride, right? You know, Candy Cane, right? So you got a lot of stigma in media behind truck drivers. That's why you see so many more billboards advertising adv law, law advocates, right? That'll take on the trucking company that wrecked your car more than you'll see billboards advertising trucking jobs, honestly. And, and and the thing is, is that if I didn't see this, if I didn't see this kind of one sidedness in the social hierarchy on a daily, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Despite it having come from my own mouth. But it, it is it is it is true. One hundred percent. And the and the thing of it is, is there's really not much that we as drivers could do to change it. 
because it just it, it kind of is one of those things that you know we are kind of vilified you know we're we're the bullies on the highway not the friends on the highway you know, a truck driver will screw you over in a heartbeat rather than, you know, stop and pull over and help you change a tire. And that just it, that I think comes down to everybody looking out for um, themselves instead of each other like it used to be. There kind of used to be this unspoken fraternity, this unspoken bond behind being a driver. And now it, you have so many new people coming in, especially, um, you know, millennials. And I'm not saying it's their fault. I'm not. It's just it's the way that it's the way that the, these people are being marketed to. It's the way that these jobs are being are being described and 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 marketed to these young people that they just they kind of just don't they don't really get it. Gotcha. And that's and, and that's a, and that's a shame. It really is because it is, and it's uh, and then that's kind of what to to kind of circle back to your original question. The the Fifi's were injured, along with kind of some personal dignity, I guess, on a personal level. That this is the kind of I don't, I don't want to use the term wrong think because I don't necessarily prescribe to that ideology. But it is definitely something that is a problem. Is that if we don't ha if we if we all think that these jobs are going away quickly more quickly than they actually are due to automation or advances in technology for example like i'm asked personally all the time well, why are you starting a trucking company and want to be bigger than swift if automation's coming and drones are going to be delivering packages and things like that well no 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 if drones are going to be specifically if you want to talk about that if drones are going to be disruptive to the industry they're going to be disruptive to ltl which is less than truckload so that's fedex ups uh, Old Dominion, uh, USPS, those sorts of things, right? You're not going to see a drone stop off at a steel mill, pick up a 50,000 pound uh, steel sheet metal coil and lift it up, you know, several hundred feet in the air and then take it 1,200 miles to the border where it's going to, you know, cross shipping lanes and go into Mexico and be made into parts for cars and be sent back. You're just not going to see that. And you're not going to see it being done on rail either. Well, what about what about like an automatically driving truck? Wait, hello. Did, I think a drone just droned his internet connection. <laughs> hello. Yeah, I do apologize about that. That was a technical difficulty on my end. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, oh, I think oh, so I had asked um, what, why can't there be self-driving trucks? Well, there. Okay, so Freightliner is is um is what's championing that here in the United States. Volvo is doing it overseas in the UK and the, uh, the Europe continent. Mm -hmm. So, but they're both owned by Daimler, um, Mercedes Benz, if you will. Right. So, um, Daimler is, is pushing that agenda full force, but you're still going to need truck. You're still going to need drivers to pilot them through the inner cities. The autonomous part is more or less like an autopilot. It's the same reason why we still have regular pilots and, you know, and a first officer to driving, you know, driving the plane from Chicago to Seattle, for example, even though automation has taken over the majority of that leg. Gotcha. Um, and, and, and it's not to say that we won't have, you know, fully autonomous trucks in the future, just right now. It's not as it's not as pertinent and it's not as um, decisive or as immediate as uh, people tend tend to make it out to be. Sure. But see a big uh, but see now a big thing is is you know and a question that I get fielded a lot are uh, especially from young younger teenagers ones that are just learning how to drive because we are um, as a startup we do take a kind of a community and reinvestment approach to. Um, how we handle our business. And one of the big things is we like to talk to the local schools about, you know, how to be safe around trucks and what to watch out for and, you know, how to not, you know, piss us off. Basically, one of the big things is, you know, getting, getting cut off in traffic, right? We can't stop on a dime. Yeah. Trucks right. usually leave extra space between them and the car in front of them. And a lot of people view that as an invitation to hop right in front of them, not realizing that the truck has that space. Yeah. That's a stopping distance. Sure. 
you know, Matt, you know what, man? And you actually, you've get, you pretty much gained my, my love and support from here on out. I don't really care where this conversation goes. No, I actually, it's the fact it's, that you said that. Yeah, no, I understand. I actually really appreciate truck drivers. Uh, it's funny because when you drive, truck drivers are typically the ones that follow uh, the rules of the road the most. They're always passing on the left. They usually move to the right when they're done passing. You give them a little, uh, I know you can give them a little flashier blinkers or your uh, brights or whatever when they're in front of you so they've got enough space to move over. I'm, I'm pretty aware of trucker dudes on the road. They're usually okay dudes. Yeah. No, exactly. And but, so we, what we want to see is we want to see a more uh, a better connection with with the civilian population on a whole. Sure. Because what what we're seeing now is that you know you will see you will see people that are out there that will um, if you flash them over and you're in a big rig, you know you flash them over they'll they'll put their four ways on to kind of thank you. Yeah, the little. And that's yeah, and and seeing that's something cool. I'm starting to get the I'm starting to get the arm pumps again, and that's actually pretty cool. Because what I used to hate was being on these long legs, and you're sitting there in traffic for hours, and you're looking down, and you see these trips, you know, these these uh, vacationers, right? And they they got the minivan all packed up, right? You know, mom's on her cell phone, dad's on his cell phone, you know, which is pisses me off right then and there. Um, and then the kids got each tab, you know, each one's the kids got a tablet or a little, you know, portable DVD player that they're watching something in the back seat. It's like everybody's so immersed with this media culture now that it's it's very hard, very seldom do you ever get those arm pumps anymore. But when you do, it's it's special. You definitely take notice. Gotcha. Sure, I, I don't disagree with any of this. Wait, so what exactly to go back to the central point? What exactly did I say to Sargon that you disagreed with so heavily? Well, actually, now after talking with you, now I kind of lost. I kind of lost my own perspective on it. But to 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 be more to be more honest with it, it really comes down to this, right? So one of the big reasons why you don't see these companies, um, like like you, because you guys had actually talked about this, and that's what got the whole disagreement mm-hmm. started. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, drop some ash on my keyboard. That's never cool. Um. One of the big things that w- was said was that, you know, well, why is there such a disper- you know, why is there such of a, uh, um, a disparaging uh, statistic between men in the workforce, women in the workforce, minor- minorities in the workforce? But my question, t- I guess, my question to you would be, if you were looking, if you were looking specifically at Sargon's example, which I kind of want to say is a poor example, but I mean, just to roll with it. If you look at construction, the minority of the people that are working construction are minorities. You don't see the white guy showing plumbers crack anymore. You see, you know, a bunch of my cousins, <laughs> a bunch of a bunch of essays, a bunch of cholos. So I, I think um, I think in general, I think our discussion had more to do with the fact that people are typically trying to move people out of the lower paying, more damaging to your body, blue collar work up to other types of more educated work. I don't know if I necessarily would agree that like a pl- I know that it's kind of weird. Different people have different um, definitions of what blue collar means. I don't know if I would necessarily include like high skilled labor. Like I consider like electrician, plumber. I think these guys are, are trades. I don't know if they necessarily have it as bad as like bricklayers or stonemasons or something or, or something like that you know but um t- t- typically i my, my criticism of blue collar work wasn't that it wasn't noble it's just that it it's usually very tough work it usually leaves you with physical disabilities into your 30s the pay is oftentimes very bad and the benefits are oftentimes non-existent there is no vacation time there is no paid sick leave or any of that sure sure okay so then can i may i ask a question in response to that then yeah sure what if you're looking at the union jobs, the union trades as as trades? What would differentiate a teamster driving a day cab, uh, hauling those doubles that you see uh, probably more often than not, um, like UPS or FedEx, those guys, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in comparison to me, somebody who has a, a full a full uh, semi. What? Well, what? Wait, what exactly are you asking me? What? The difference what would what would differentiate the two because that that's kind of how that's kind of how the field is already broken down you have what they would call the skilled trade which is the teamsters because you do need to have a bat an aptitude battery in order to become an apprentice as a teamster mm-hmm. whereas over otr drivers and this is and i'll, I'll touch you know what I'll, I'll save this towards the end um 
OTR drivers, people like Swift, Schneider, JB Hunt, CRST, CR England, and those places, um, you don't even need a GED. You know, so what would that be considered unskilled versus skilled? Because one requires a high school diploma upon entry and along with an aptitude test versus the other one, you just you go to school, you learn the skills and then well, I don't, you become a driver. I don't know if the distinction is necessarily important in between like skilled and unskilled. I guess just the general argument is that it seems like people in society generally want to move their offspring up into the best jobs possible. And very rarely does it seem like parents want their children to be moving into back-breaking, low-pay, low-benefit labor. Usually they want them to move. Oftentimes it's higher educated. It could also be higher skilled or it could be some type of parallel field. But oftentimes you don't want your child to be, uh, you know, growing up to, to do, you know, really, really hard labor for, you know, 34000 a year or something with no chance of promotion and very little opportunity for advancement. Well, see, and that's something that I could personally attest to, I guess, because my grandfather was the one who pretty much raised me. My grandfather and my grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather was a Chicago policeman and my grandmother was a homemaker. And they both told me the, this this age-old, you know, um, piece of advice, this sage wisdom, right? Work with your brain and not with your back. I, unfortunately, was cursed with um, a keen knack for academia. So, like, I was pushed heavily into, you know, I always had private tutors. I really didn't have a lot of friends growing up, right? So by the time I finished college, which was at a pretty young age, mind you, I had gotten an undergraduate degree in a field that was primarily uh, full of smart people, right? Okay. It, I wouldn't necessarily... It, it, I don't want to give too much of my personal story away because I don't, per, first of all, I don't really feel it's all that relevant, but, um, it, it was in the, um, social sciences field. Okay. Now what made me become a truck driver was because, um, I was working for a company, uh, doing, uh, some research stuff. And I had actually, they, one of the things that we were doing was we were talking with drivers and actually being able to sit down with these people and get, kind of get to know them on, on, a, on a fundamental level, what kind of person they were. Um, really kind of opened my eyes to, you know, hey, this actually sounds like a lot of fun. I kind of want to try this out. And I ended up loving it. And so here I sit. You know, it, it, I think, like I said, I think it all comes down to, you know, voluntarism. You... You choose the job that best fits you and your personality rather than what would make you more money or not. Because if you're just going off of the economic side of things, that's not always going to entitle you to a, a not, not necessarily a better life in one aspect, but a better life overall. I'm not sure if you would agree with that or not. No, I definitely agree. It's better to make a little bit less and be happy with what you do than make a lot and be miserable. I took a 52% took a pay cut to work here. Wow. <laughs> to be to be fair. So, yeah, I mean, do I miss the money? Sure, because, you know, I like I like to be able to kind of travel on my own and, uh, you know, take trips and uh, like uh, Germany and Amsterdam and uh, Jamaica and things like that. But I mean, I can still afford these things. I just have to meet, really watch my my spending and, you know, put money away and make sure all my bills are covered and whatnot. It's 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 just it's more of a challenge. It's not necessarily impossible. It just makes it more a little bit more difficult. Gotcha. Um, okay, well, was there anything else you wanted to go over? Well, one of the other things that you had talked about, I think this was in a different video. Um, if you could clarify for me, what was your position on health care? Um, in the United States, or what do you mean? No, uh, just, well, in the United States. We, we're, both, we're both U.S. citizens, so let's keep it local. Um, I mean, what about it? That's a pretty broad question. I mean, what in what specifically? The, cause I, if I'm not mistaken, your understanding was that we, we could benefit from a, a, a more socialized healthcare industry. Um, it's possible. I, 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 the numbers, everything is like really complicated with healthcare in the United States. But yeah, it seems like that's what other countries do to a greater level of success than what we currently do. So it seems like that's the direction we should probably move in. Because one of the things, um, one of the things that we get, we as a, as a company, get uh, a lot of flack over, is that we um, 
we've kind of taken we've kind of taken these fundamental principles more or less what we just talked about you know that you know hey look this isn't just a job this is a career you should have you know you should be proud of what you do because and this is why um kind of approach and we kind of do break it down to people before we actually bring them into um an academy and get them their cdls and then actually take them out on the road and start training them so one of the other things that we do um going back to the community and reinvestment part was um we're actually uh doing a small a small test experiment right now with a program that employs uh that actually brings uh, qualified applicants that are displaced so you're talking basically homeless people that um aren't necessarily chronically homeless right so you're not talking necessarily about those that have been out on the streets for decades and have you know large mental uh uh mental faculty issues or chemical dependency issues you're talking about somebody that lost their job and lost their place and not really able to get themselves back on their feet with whatever low skilled labor they're able to uh to get right these these amazon jobs these mcdonald's jobs right so what we what we've done is we realize that like for example here here at swift my day job right um i make roughly about a thousand a week and about a hundred and twenty dollars of that comes out for uh medical expenses my health care benefits my hospitalization insurance my dental my vision my life insurance all that stuff okay. what we what we've done is we decided to say hey to make this more affordable what if we as a company kind of redefined what we de- how we define success right and let's bring down some of that cost so let's find you know private medical providers that will work with us we'll pay them cash on demand for preventative care right so your your annual checkups and whatnot right and then what you're actually paying for when you're paying these insurance companies instead you're just paying the hospitalization right so your emergency room cover is covered your uh if you need to be admitted your admittance fees are covered your hospital stay is covered um prescriptions are co- are uh, 2080 split on our uh 80 on our end and so on and so forth from there so if all company my 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 direct question to you would be if all companies kind of sort of adopted this po- a more a more socialist po- not necessarily a hundred percent you know we're going to eat all these medical you know medical costs right but if they took a more socialist stance on some of these issues do you think that some of these jobs might see a pay increase well wouldn't the jobs see a pay decrease because you're spending more money on health care and stuff from the company not necessarily i mean oh, for example i mean we're paying the the specific program that we're, i'm talking about with us is um right now um is basically borrowing and adopting uh the united states military's pay schedule right so what we do is we we sit down with somebody uh on a case-by-case basis they tell us a bit about themselves and how long they've been homeless and whatnot and what we do is we start them off on a base pay salary of about eighteen thousand a year then we actually add local the local rent average for you know if they're a single person it's a single you know a studio or a single bedroom if they have children then it's obviously a two bedroom or a three bedroom so on and so forth from there i mean there's sure. there's nuances but like whatever you pay them now if you would just axe the healthcare stuff completely couldn't you just pay that in the form of wages to your employees not necessarily because you still got to be competitive like for example if if i just said oh hey we're eating 100% of your your medical costs but we're only going to pay you you know $7 an hour let's say right let's just keep it an even number $7 an hour but if they went to another company in the same job that would train them right they could make 13 to 14 dollars an hour but out of that would come their own personal medical medical expenses i mean you would have to be an asinine person with some really foolhardy intentions to to pass that up yeah but that's what i'm saying let's say that you're offering 13 an hour and you cover you know so many medical benefits for people let's say that you didn't cover the medical benefits couldn't you pay them 14 or 15 an hour instead 
Not ne- well again, not necessarily because then we would be considering then we would be considered excuse me overpaying because the 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 average industry let's let's say for a dispatcher right an office job a dispatcher for a trucking company in in the northwest um, the 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 Midwest right so uh, like we're based out of Wisconsin so the average dispatcher in that area would be roughly about thirteen twenty five an hour. So if we start paying them fifteen bucks an hour, then we're overpaying. We I mean we want to be competitive, sure, but we don't we don't necessarily want to be overpaying either, because then we're just shooting ourselves in the foot. Gotcha. I mean you still gotta look at you still have to look at what what labor what labor is affordable and what the labor is actually worth. You can't I mean like our our company's name is Sua Sponte. It's Latin. It means of our own accord. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we get to do whatever we want for for no apparent good reason. Sure. Um, I I mean I guess to answer your question on if every company did that, it sounds like it would be okay. Um, one, I don't know how comfortable I am with the idea of your healthcare being tied to your work. That makes me really uncomfortable. But two, it doesn't seem like this is going to happen because it hasn't happened yet. It seems like. We, you know, there's been years and years and years for companies to do this, but they haven't done it. So it doesn't seem like that's going to be something that companies are interested in doing. Well, honestly, I don't think it's a discussion that's being had, and I think that's part of the problem. Well, healthcare has um, been a pretty active discussion in the country for the past two decades. I would say we've been talking about healthcare quite a bit. The, I mean, I'm talking about that specific option. Um, you, you are starting to see some companies here and there doing a health savings plan, but that's not quite the same. Mm-hmm. That, that really isn't the same. And to equate it as such would be intellectually dishonest, I feel. Yeah, of course. But, the FSA, the flex spending accounts and the, and the health savings plans are not a substitute for insurance. I agree with that, of course. So, I mean, but on a national level, right? I mean, let's let's look at again. Let's look at industry specific statistics, right? So, trucking trucking does have 3.5 million people in its industry, but we're still about 50,000 drivers short, and it's every year we're about between 50 to 70,000 drivers short. It always fluctuates. Mm-hmm. So, the demand is always going to be there to have more people come in. If you if you look at the average person that goes through some of these local assistance programs, um, soup kitchens and uh, emergency shelters and things like that. If you take all those statistics, it averages out to about 556,000 as of 2016, I believe. Um, And then if you break that down into take all those people and then you take the basically the 1%, which is about what the average would be for somebody to actually be qualified uh, by the uh, FBI and Department of Homeland Security, who does all of our background checks, um, and in and, and an industry-wide level, um, specifically because it is very easy, as been as been demonstrated with history's past, to turn a, a, a any kind of truck basically into a bomb, um, or do something other else that's illegal, like uh, the example I gave earlier with the uh, the, dr- the independent driver that uh, had all those people in the back of his trailer mm-hmm. uh, doing trafficking stuff so we 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 as an industry really do kind of we don't necessarily want to be more lax on our background checks necessarily but to say that you know hey roughly about one percent of the all those people would qualify to get to get into a trucking school right okay so one, you're basically taking one percent of five hundred and fifty six thousand which would be roughly about what Fifty-five thousand. Ten percent. Ten percent. Ten percent would be fifty-five thousand. So one percent of that would be five. What five thousand fifty-six hundred? Maybe five thousand five hundred. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Um, my brain's kind of fried. It's the end of my shift. So. Um, what are you driving but, right now? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm done driving for the day. Gotcha. Um, so, so you you got to understand. So. You got you got room to play with there. You got another five thousand people that haven't been ha, haven't been even approached as if to say, "Hey, we want to recruit you for this career field that'll definitely get you out of your situation here." And especially if you're a single individual who's been displaced, because your your house is basically no more than a foot away 
from where you work, so to speak. Sure. I mean, the federal regulations, uh, US DOT does say that you need to have a current address that's up to date uh, in order for you to uh, maintain your CDL. And that's basically for citations for records and things like that. Kind of keep keep track of where you're at, right? Sure. To, uh, in layman's terms. Mm-hmm. So, but still, I mean, how hard is it to go approach a family member and say, hey, I have this job. You know, it's going to make me some pretty decent money. It's going to help me in my immediate position. And then I can always go back and reapproach the idea of going back to school or doing whatever it is um, after that. So – but I need an address. Can I use your mailbox to send my stuff to? I'm pretty sure a family member is not going to object. They might say no to you staying there, right, and doing the whole couch surfing thing. But they're definitely not going to object for you using the address as a job. I, at least if, if they did, it would have to be on some fundamental level. Like you probably pissed them off something beyond repair at that point, I think. Sure. But no. So basically – basically again you know it, it you know I, I didn't i didn't mean to come off as somebody that was trying to troll you or anything i don't i honestly don't I, like i said before i didn't i don't really know that much about you to try to do that anyway and you know i, I always hated those kind of people anyhow because I, I get them a lot in my inbox so i'm you know i'm pretty sure that's how i came off and i do again i do apologize it was pretty unprofessional of me but at the same time it, like, like we just discussed basically right so it's it's just this it's it's this idea right that you have you have these jobs that are that are looked down upon by some people not not necessarily by you but by some people as to say well this isn't going to work for me because i have let's let's say for example and i see this a lot with my personal friends that i have made throughout the years right so they go to school for something they get re- you know they get recruited into doing like a lot of my friends went into game design back when that was still a big thing um, and what are they doing now? Absolutely nothing. They're still living at home and they work at Starbucks or something, right? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> like, that was basically you put yourself about fifty or sixty thousand in debt for a for a price tag on a on a certificate that doesn't work. Well, but that's not really that fair, right? There's a lot. I mean, the average college degree holder will earn more than the average non degree holder. You can always find one off examples of people that do things that don't work out, but in general, people with degrees earn. I think it's thirteen thousand a year more than people that don't earn degrees. No, and I and I would agree with that statistic. And I'm not. The, I'm definitely not saying that it's not true because I mean, you can like my my undergrad, for example. The if I would have paid cash and gotten a, just a bunch of student loans, I would have had to have paid the seventy two thousand dollars sticker mm-hmm. price for my de- my undergrad degree from the university I went to, which is a big name university. It's a private institution, and that's that's a lot of money for somebody that's coming right out of well for most people anyway coming right out of high school that maybe have worked one or two jobs their entire career sure but if you look at it, if you look at it from a different perspective and you look at this as something that's a jumping off point doing doing a blue collar job not for long term but just to help you pay those bills off, a lot of them would be full-time jobs, sure. But at the same time, how many how many degrees are now being offered online that you could take in your spare time and still accomplish what you want to accomplish? I mean, they even have nursing certificates now where all you really have to come in for is to do your hours as far as your internship. I don't know how many of those online degrees are like legitimate or carry the same weight as like a normal degree. And if you're getting something in nursing, I'm sure you still have to put in um, physical hours. Um, like if you're doing a CNA or you're getting a, or if you want to be an RN, especially like I know that you have to put in physical hours of working at certain places to qualify. Yeah, well, that's like I said, that's discounting internships, right? So we're just talking about the degree in and of itself. The the, the yeah, learning. but like even for like, I don't think you could get like a CNA without even a CNA, which is I think only a two-year program. I don't think you could get that for like a certified nursing assistant. I don't think you could get that without putting in physical hours working at some place. Well, and even then, they have part-time community colleges and whatnot that'll offer CNA degrees, and you could do that like as a, like a night school alternative. Sure. So, I mean, it's not to say that it's – again, it depends on your field of study. Obviously, if you're going in for computer sciences and you want to be 
you know, this, um, you know, this, this huge, um, you want to work, your, your end all goal is to work for this huge IT firm, right? Mm-hmm. You don't necessarily want to go to an online school to do that. And that's understandable. But again, it comes down to volunteerism. You have to look at your, all your personal choices and not weigh anything out. And I think, I feel like the blue collar field is, is kind of sort of being weighted out against more than four, uh, with, with a lot of people that are, that are peers of mine. I mean, you, you and I were born roughly about the same time frame, right? So, I mean, it's not, it's not to say that at the end of the day, you know, no matter what you do, it's still a service and it's still honorable, right? You doing, um, if you, and I'm not, I'm not, again, I don't really know that much about you, but I'm assuming you do this full time. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, and it, I wouldn't, I would never put you down for that. Yeah. And I wouldn't to anybody else. Of course, I never make fun of people for working a certain type of job. It's not to say that any, it, there's, there's a lot of jobs out there that suck. Yeah. But they're not dishonorable. They're not, not, they're not, not noble. Sure. The, the, the question, the questions more or less that I had for you at that point were, kind of more or less what exact kind of more or less for you to clarify what you and Sargon were talking about because at the end of the day it's that's exact that is kind of exactly what it sounded like you were saying I mean that might not have been your intended purpose for bringing those things up but that that is kind of what what it sounded like you had said sure it was more it more had to do with just people generally try to move out of this field of work rather than move into it was was just the general kind of discussion well, see, and see, and again, like specifically with trucking is that you do see that you see a lot of people moving into it and then they'll be here for a couple of years. They'll get some experience and then they'll go work for, um, you know, they'll go join one of the trade unions, for example, like being a teamster where they're going to be home every day. They now have more personal freedoms. They don't have to sacrifice so much because they have they they have that that time to themselves mm-hmm. where they can basically do whatever they want. Now, me. Unfortunately for me, I kind of fell with the rom- it fell into the romanticism of of the career field of of my choosing, which was you know that's kind of be that that vagabond and travel around. But that's mainly just because growing up in the inner city, not necessarily great for me <laughs> uh, as far as being a smart kid, because I basically had one of two options: it, it was either join a gang or um. Oh, hello. Oh. Truck stop Wi-Fi, man. I swear. Oh, it's all good. So, but um, there was something else I kind of wanted to ask you in terms of your position on what you, you guys had talked about was, what do you think about in terms of somebody who doesn't really feel that they have a lot of college prospects? I mean, how would how would you answer for those people? I mean, you want the best opportunities available for everybody, right? So, I mean, I don't, well, I don't know. What do you mean? I mean, ideally, you want college to be an option for everybody. That should be your, probably your first goal, right? Well, I think college and trade school don't necessarily go hand in hand. I mean, for example, uh, the average truck school can get you in and out within three weeks, 180 hours. In fact, the, the uh, one of the big things that we're against is um, the governing lobby for trucking, uh, which is the American Trucking um, Association, ATA. They actually... Um, pushed through a law that said um, some pretty shady stuff going on in it. Basically what they said is you only need 30 hours of skills and behind the road, uh, behind the wheel training to get your CDL. But you can't learn anything in 30 hours. I mean, come on, let's be reasonable here. Sure, I, sure, I mean, I can't speak to specific trucking standards. I don't know anything about it, but sure. Well, I mean, it, it would be like I mean, could you let's 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 take your previous career or, or job field uh, into account for a second? I mean, could you if you were training somebody new? I mean, would you be able to possibly show them everything that there was to know about carpet cleaning within thirty hours? Um, yeah, I mean, but I worked for a small business, so it was really shitty. They pretty much had you working uh, after the first week. Typically, what you would do is you would shadow somebody for a while, and then the, and then you'd be on your own truck in a week or two. 
And then if you had questions, you would just have to call somebody to figure it out. But yeah, it was pretty shitty. But it was also like a small business. So I don't know. They weren't like official training procedures or anything. And I don't think you have to get licensed to be a carpet cleaner, or at least I, I never was licensed for it. So no, I don't. I don't necessarily think so either. At least I've never heard of that. But I mean, then again, I mean, you would know about it more about it than I would. So, but I mean, I don't know. I think. I think what it was, I think what it, what I'm, what I'm willing to boil it down to was that, I mean, it just, it wasn't really, because I, I kind of listened to the whole thing and then specifically that part that, um, one of my people had referenced, um, the whole thing kind of just sounded really rushed. I mean, you guys had talked about so much and so little bit of time. I don't really think you guys even really came to an agreement on anything really and I don't necessarily I don't necessarily say that that's because you both disagree I think it's more or less just because no I think I, I disagree with pretty much everything Carl says <laughs> I think that's a fair summary of my position but I mean I don't know it still seems like an hour or however long it was it was an hour two hours that you guys were talking I mean it doesn't it, the video he posted was two hours and 27 minutes you posted one that was uh, two hours and 25 minutes so in change so I mean to say that to say that you could cover that many topics in two hours and not necessarily you know come to some sort of decisiveness mm-hmm. I don't know it doesn't really seem like it'd be fair to me I, I think I think honestly if you want to, if you if you're gonna go online and you're gonna you're gonna take a firm stance with something, I mean, cover one thing at a time and make it an entire video. I mean, that's how I stand on it. Sure. I mean, if you're gonna talk about if you're gonna talk about immigration and economics as as a, as a pair, then talk about immigration and economics. Don't don't branch off into other subjects, which is something that, I mean, I I've more or less like I've been talking with some other uh, some other YouTubers that I personally follow. Um, and I will kind of be looking at more of your stuff here, just more or less, because I'm curious. But uh, and I do appreciate you know the, you taking the time out. But um, we had we had this thing going for a while that was um, you know hey we'll offer if you you know if you really do feel about like this about this we'll actually pony up three hundred bucks to uh, donate specifically to your Patreon account to actually sit down and have a discussion about that topic. And uh, it didn't really exactly go over that well. Most everybody thought we were just trolling them. But um, it did open up some dialogue with some of them. And, and most of them, what they had said was um, – and how we do – and how we handle those discussions is we talk about one topic at a time. And it, it, it seems to go a lot better than some of these other debates that you see online. And I'm not necessarily talking about yours specifically. No, I agree. Having a two hour, you can have a two, you can have a 10 hour conversation on immigration or healthcare or any number of issues that people tend to gloss over very quickly. I don't disagree with that. Yeah. So, but yeah, um, no, I do, I do appreciate taking the time out and you know, you, uh, you've been a pretty gracious host and everything. And I do appreciate you uh, trying to clarify some of the stuff that, that had been said. And I think, I think personally, like I said, I think, you know, given the opportunity to kind of clarify some of these things that were more or less glossed over and just kind of said uh, as a glancing blow to one another, I think doing it that way is, is much more, um, confusing. Sure. Than just actually being able just to sit down with somebody and kind of just kind of hash hash out one topic at a time, you know, it, it's it's um it's refreshing though to see that somebody is out there that actually says no 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 you know what you can't you can't just cut off that space between a truck man you got to give them some room. Sure. Well, hey, I I appreciate you guys. Um, like I said, I actually really enjoy truck drivers on the road. Um, I think that for the most part, they follow the rules better than most of the other horrible fucking drivers out there. So, um, <laughs> thanks for the conversation and I will talk to you some other time, maybe. Yeah, no problem. My line's always open. If All you right. got any questions or anything, uh, feel free. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.